This morning, I want to talk about uh, a very incredible character in the Bible. Um, only two books in the Bible are named after women, and this is one of those books, Ruth. So this morning, I titled my message, uh, Life of Ruth, and uh, the best is yet to come. That's what I want to tell you this morning. The best is yet to come. And uh, basically, the book of Ruth is um, God's incredible providence in a time of great darkness in the lives of people. And that's what the book of Ruth is all about. And we're going to try to kind of zoom through that book here this morning and kind of establish uh, the incredible incident that is recorded in the Bible about the life. So basically, you know, according to Ruth chapter 1, verse 1, you know, um, the, the, the story of Ruth is taking place just at the uh, time or during the turn of the time of the judges. And basically, this is a 400-year period after Israel had entered the Promised Land under Joshua. And before they had their own set king, this was the time of the judges, is what the Bible says. And so the book of Judges kind of comes right before Ruth. So if you're going to look in your Bible for the book of Ruth, you'll find the book of Judges um, right before the book of Ruth. And basically, if you read the last scripture of the book of Judges, um, which is Judges chapter 21, verse 25. These are the words that are written in the Bible. And it says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes, and it was a time of great darkness. So there was a, a spiritual darkness that hung over the children of Israel, and it was under, uh, on this backdrop of a setting the book of, of, of Ruth begins. It's almost like the children of Israel, you know, I mentioned this before, the book of Judges, you know, goes through the cycle of where, you know, they, they forsake God and, and, and turn to idols. So God hands them over to their enemies. And then when they're oppressed by their enemies, they turn back to God and, and ask God to forgive them. And as soon as God forgives them and delivers them out of the hands of the enemies, they repeat the whole thing again. So it's kind of a cycle that repeats through the entire book of Judges where, you know, a lot of their relationship with God was all about more outward appearances, and there was almost a lack of righteousness and the people of righteousness in the nation of Israel. So it was kind of in this backdrop, the book of Judges begins, and the book of Judges also ends on a great hope, and we're going to look at that in just a few moments. And basically, um, it just kind of establishes that God is prevailing and will prevail in our life in spite of the circumstances and whatever surrounds us. That's the, th the whole theme of the book of Ruth. You know, it's like the life of a godly person is not a straight line to glory, but the assurance is God will get you there, but the road to it is not going to be easy. In other words, the life of a godly person is not like the four-lane highway to the city of Bangalore, but rather it is the uh, hairpin bend filled road to Uti. You know, it's like you don't know what's coming around the corner. You know, you're going around the curve and someone could be coming right at you. And it's a, it's a perilous journey. And, you know, there's a huge valley on one side. You don't know, you know, if there's a protection on one side. And basically the only assurance that you have as a as a, a sojourner, is that as long as I keep going forward, I'm going to get higher and higher and higher. That's what it is. As long as you don't stop, as long as you keep moving forward, you're going to get higher and higher. At, at some point in time, you're going to reach your destination. So touch your neighbor and tell them, you're going to get there, just keep walking. I was going to say driving, but we're talking about the analogy of walking here in life. So the book of Ruth is one of those books that reminds you that there is hope in spite of perplexing times. There's hope in spite of, you know, hopelessness in our life as well. In the setbacks of your life as a child of God, there is this um, <clears throat> resilient confidence that comes in that says God is going to display His amazing glory and splendor in your life as well. Now, you could say that the, the story of, of, of Ruth, the book of Ruth, is basically a series of setbacks. Yeah? You can see a lot of setbacks that are repeated in, in, in throughout the book of Ruth. So, for example, when you begin the book of Ruth in chapter 1, uh, Naomi and, and, her, and her husband and two sons, they're leaving 
Judah. They're leaving um, the region of Judah uh, because there's a great famine and they leave to go out in search of food. And then as she's in a foreign land, you know, in Moab, her husband dies, you know, and then her two sons die and without leaving any heir. So pretty much at the right at the beginning of, of the book of Ruth, it's established that Naomi has suffered some great setbacks in her life. You know, when she probably left Judah, she was hoping and had a dream that her life is finally going to turn around. She's going to have peace. She's going to have some great things happen to her. But everything that she thought would happen did not happen, but the opposite happens in her life. And she pretty much comes back into Bethlehem, and these are her words. She says to the people, she says, I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. And she says to the people, the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. So in other words, she's telling everyone, you know, I was, I was really relying on God. I was really trusting on God to make this work out for my life. But I tell you, God's been, you know, incredibly severe with me. You know, I've had such incredible pain. I feel like God's hand is against me. That was where Naomi stood as she came back into Bethlehem. She felt like all of heaven was against her. She felt like, even though she was a Jew, that God was actually working against her and not for her, which is incredibly tragic if you think about a person being in that place. And then you, you kind of move on to chapter 2, and Naomi is kind of suddenly given a new hope in her life where she feels like, oh, there's a potential husband for Ruth, which is Boaz. So there's this, you know, kind of a... a a semi-romance kind of beginning to birth between, you know, Ruth and Boaz in that chapter. But then, you know, um, Boaz doesn't take the first step. You know, he doesn't propose to Ruth. And so he doesn't make any moves. And then it seems at first like, you know, he's not interested in Ruth. So then the kind of the chapter two ends with this incredible brimming hope as, as, as there's an anticipation of something that will change, something that's going to happen in the life of Ruth. You know, and then... It doesn't seem like nothing's happening. So it's again, feels like there's a movement forward and then two steps back. Have you ever felt that way in your life? You feel like you're moving forward and something's working out and then you find yourself three steps back and you're thinking, what is going on in my life? Every time I try to move forward and I feel like I'm making progress, I find myself farther behind than when I started out as well. And that's what Naomi was feeling in our life. Every time it looked like there was a glimmer of hope that was kind of dawning on them, again, it was shut out and it felt like, oh, it's all gone again. And then you start chapter 3, and then Naomi and Ruth, they make a very risky move. You know, basically Ruth goes to Boaz uh, on the threshing floor in the middle of the night, and this is a Jew, Jew, Jewish tradition where, you know, it has the, the, the thing that she does was symbolic in the sense at the middle of the night she goes and takes the garments of Boaz and puts it over herself, indicating that she is expecting him to look after her as well. And then, you know, Boaz kind of wakes up the next morning and realizes what's happened. And then again, there's kind of a, a, a glimmer of hope again, which Boaz says, I'm interested. I want to get this happening. You know, I want to be your kinsman redeemer. And just as Boaz is about to take Ruth as his wife, again, there's another setback where they begin to say, oh, actually, there's another person who's a closer relative to Naomi than you are, Boaz. So maybe it's not going to work out again. So then chapter 3 ends with the suspense again. Is it or is it not going to work out in the life of Ruth? Is she going to find her hope? Is she going to have her life established? Or is it all going to go back again to where it was? And then you come to chapter 4. And I want to spend a little bit of time here this morning looking at chapter 4 and the incredible journey that Ruth, Ruth takes in her life as well. So take your Bibles. Like I said, right after the book of Judges comes the book of Ruth. And it's only four chapters in the book of Ruth. And we're going to read pretty much the entire chapter of four here to set a tone for what we want to uh, establish here this morning. So you got it? You found Ruth? Ruth chapter four, and this is what the Bible says. Boaz, and this is right after the incident I just talked about, Boaz went to the town gate and took a seat there. Just then the family redeemer he had mentioned came by. So Boaz called out to him, come over here and sit down, my friend. I want to talk to you. So they sat down together. Then Boaz called ten leaders from the town and asked them to sit as witnesses. And Boaz said to the family redeemer, You know Naomi, who came back from Moab. 
She is selling the land that belonged to our rel relative Elimelech. And I thought I should speak to you about it so that you can redeem it if you wish. If you want the land, then buy it here in the presence of these witnesses. But if you don't want it, let me know right now because I am next in line to redeem it after you. Then the man replied, the Bible says, all right, I'll redeem it. As a reader, you're reading, it's like, oh, no, don't do that, man. Boaz likes this girl. Don't, don't redeem it. You know, you're kind of cheering for Boaz. Are you with me? Yeah, when you're reading, it's like, what's going on? And, and if that book had ended there, you'd be like, that was just a horrible story. That was such a horrible account of a person. And, you know, it's like every time it looks like something good is about to happen, this guy who doesn't even know Ruth, doesn't even care about her, suddenly says, oh, I'll take the field. But I like Boaz. He's a very diplomatic man who knew how to tackle situations and circumstances. And he then very tactfully begins to, you know, disclose to this guy more information. Then verse 5 says, Then Boaz told him, Of course, your purchase of the land from Naomi also requires that you marry Ruth. He just doesn't say, just marry Ruth, you know, the daughter-in-law of of Naomi, then he kind of puts the little nudge says, the Moabite woman. The Moabite woman, because all Jews, you know, you know they don't want to have anything to do with other, other women from other culture. It says the Moabite woman. That way she can have children who will carry on her husband's name and keep the land in their family. So basically, dude, if you got this land, it comes with a lot of strings attached. But at the end of the day, the land's not going to be yours anyways. That's what he's saying. And then the guy is like, oh, okay, okay, let me think about it. And he says, then I can't redeem it. The family redeemer replied, because this might endanger my own estates. He was thinking about his wife waiting there with an actual chapati roller. If he ever took that woman, he was going to get beat up that day. He's like, come on, I can't do it. I have my own problems. I have my own estate. This is not going to work out. You redeem the land. I cannot do it. I washed myself out of this whole mess. And now in those days, it was the custom in Israel for anyone transferring a right of purchase to remove his sandal and hand it to the other party. I dare you to do that next time you're making a deal with someone. After you sign the deal, you take your shoe and give it to them and see what happens. This publicly validated the transaction. So the other family redeemer drew off his sandal as he said to Boaz, you buy the land. Then Boaz said to the elders and to the crowd standing around, you are witnesses that today I have, brought, I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilion, and Mahalon. And with the land I have acquired Ruth, the Moabite widow of Mahalon, to be my wife. This way, she can have a son to carry on the family name of her dead husband and to inherit the family property here in this hometown. You are all my witnesses today. Then the elders and all the people standing in the gate replied, We are witnesses. May the Lord make this woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, from whom all the nations of Israel descended. May you prosper in Epaproth and be famous in Bethlehem. May the Lord give your descendants by this young woman who will be like those of our ancestors, Perez, the son of Tamar and Judah. And then it says, So Boaz took Ruth into his home, and she became his wife. When he slept with her, the Lord enabled her to become pregnant. She gave birth to a son. The women of the town said to Naomi, Praise the Lord, who has now provided a redeemer for your family. May this child be famous in Israel. May he restore your youth and care for you in your old age, for he is the son of your daughter-in-law who loves you and has been better to you than seven sons. Then we're going to jump to 18. And this is a very important part. It says, This is the genealogical record of their ancestor Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron was the father of Ram. Ram was the father of Amidinab, and Amidinab was the father of Nashlon, or Nashon, and Nashon was the father of Salmon. Salmon was the father of Boaz, Boaz was the father of Obed, and Obed was the father of Jesse, and Jesse was the father of David. Can you say an amen to God's word? Amen. This is an amazing, amazing chapter, and I'm so excited because we're going to really delve into this uh, and look into what the Bible is really saying here. Um, even though the book is titled Ruth, um, kind of a lot of attention is given uh, to Naomi. Quite a lot of focus is given to Naomi. Like 
like I said, the very beginning of, of the book, it talks about Naomi's problems, Naomi's incredible loss. And what, what's, what's strange is that, um, you know, in the end of the chapter where we read, when, when, when Ruth gives birth to a son, people actually say it's Naomi's son. You know, they're actually commending Naomi for giving birth, whereas it was not Naomi, but it was Ruth who gave birth. Again, it kind of goes, goes to show that God was always working in both their lives in restoring his incredible promise over their lives as well. And Ruth was kind of written as a book to, to be a reminder to help us remember the grace of God and that God helps us in his grace at all times, even though you may not see the evidence of the work of God in your life as well. Just like the song we sang, you know, uh, Sam sang it. He said, you know, even though we don't see it, God is working, yeah? Even though we can't experience it, God is still working. And that's the incredible theme that is kind of uh, repetitive throughout the book of Ruth, that even though you don't see God in an outward way working, there is a behind the scenes of God working in the life of Ruth and Naomi. Now, I want to talk about three incredible miracles that happened in the life of Naomi and Ruth. And at times, Naomi did not even realize the miracle was happening, but God was doing it. It's similar to many of us. God may be in the middle of a miracle in your life, and you may not totally not even see it. He's actually setting it up in your life, and we're still crying out saying, oh, we're cursed, we're not blessed, God's not with us. And Naomi was kind of in that position where God was already at great work in her life, but she still could not see it. And this is what I mean. Here's the first miracle that happened in Naomi's life. So Naomi, you know, made the decision, I'm going to go back to, to Bethlehem, where I came from. So she's lost everything. She's lost her husband. She's lost her two sons and pretty much has two daughter-in-laws. That's all she has. So she must have been a good mother-in-law of some sort because when she said, I'm going back to Bethlehem, both those daughter-in-laws say they're coming with her. Now, you and I know that when it comes to the relationship between a mother-in-law and a daughter-in-law, it is a well-known fact they two do not get along. Can I hear an amen? Don't, don't say it. <laughs> Married people especially, beware, that's a trap. Um, Mother-in-laws and daughter-in-laws, it has been a historical tradition and a time and a way of being in life where it's just an unwritten code that mother-in-laws, I mean daughter-in-laws, do not get along with mother-in-laws. They just don't. They're always at, 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 at strife, you know. Uh, I'm not talking from personal experience. I'm talking more <laughs> from, from the sense of, of normal tradition that happens as well. Uh, and, and this is what's happened. Here's Naomi. Pretty much, it's like this was the worst thing God can do to her is leave her with two daughter-in-laws. Of all the things, leave her with, why didn't he kill them too? It would have been a better deal. She could have been all alone. But God leaves her with two daughter-in-laws. And out of the two daughter-in-laws, she has this kind of a, a, a chat with them on the way as she's leaving out the door. Oprah is one and Ruth is one. And he kind of Oprah, you know, kind of it says, I'm coming, I'm coming. But when Naomi begins to break it down as to what's going to happen, then Oprah's like, I'm not sure, I don't want to come. She kind of quits. But then Ruth, even though hearing all these things, then says to Naomi, and these are her words in, in, in Ruth chapter 1, verse 16. These are the words of Ruth. Ruth says to her, these are infamous words that we all know very well. She says, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Isn't that awesome? She says, I'm not going to leave you. Wherever you go, I'm going to go. Wherever you live, I'm going to live. And your God is going to be my God, and your people are going to be my people. Now, I tell you this, Naomi, when she heard these words come out of the mouth of Ruth, she should have looked up to heaven and said, God, you're working a miracle. Right? 
Because I, I don't know how many daughter-in-law say those words. And here was a woman who was a Moabite who had nothing to do with the Jews. And they knew that the Jewish people hated them because of the law. That God had already said that you are not to marry women from other culture. And yet this woman says to Ruth, I mean Naomi, she says, wherever you go, I go. Wherever you live, I live. And your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. And here's what I want to tell you here this morning. God can use the most unlikely people in your life to set you up for a mighty miracle. If He can use a daughter-in-law to bless a mother-in-law, God can do much, much greater. <laughs> Did you know that sometimes God uses the person that you least like and through them He puts you on your way to your miracle and your breakthrough? See, not many people say amen to that because we don't like it. We don't want them to be responsible for our, our miracle and our breakthrough. But sometimes the way God operates is, the way God gives you your breakthrough and your miracle is through the most unlikely people. And the people you thought could never help you, the people you gave very little respect or actual reverence to, could be the very person that God could raise up to bring about a mighty miracle in your life as well. Which means don't underestimate anyone in your life because when God decides to move, He can use anyone, anytime, any place to do what He wants to do as well in your life. This moment, this morning, I want to tell you the best is yet to come in your life. And God is going to use people that you never thought of. God's going to use some family members that you never even gave a second thought about. And they could be the very people that are going to put you on your road to your miracle and your breakthrough. And God is able to do that. Amen. That's a promise that God gives to His children. He says, I can use anyone, any person, any time to be able to do a mighty work in your life. Now, here's a second miracle. Naomi expresses to Ruth the, the hopelessness of following her. She says to, to both her daughter-in-laws, you know, these are the words of Naomi. She says in, in Ruth chapter 1, verse 12, she says, My daughters, return to your parents' home, for I am too old to marry again. And even if it were possible, and I were to get married tonight and bear sons, then what? In other words, in Naomi's mind, she had reached the end of the road. She could not see any possibility of her life ever amounting to anything. As far as she was concerned, she was going to die a poor, miserable, lonely death surrounded by no one. That's basically what she was saying to these two women. She says, where I'm going, you don't want to come. What I'm about to experience, you don't want to experience. Because my life, if you think it's bad now, is only going to get even worse. Those were the words of Naomi to her daughter-in-law. But here's what I want to tell you here this morning. A bend in the road does not mean it is the end of the road. Yeah? A bend in the road does not mean it is the end of the road. Shake your neighbor and tell them, just because you can't see the miracle does not mean the miracle's not there. Come on, shake them up and say, just because you can't see the miracle does not mean the miracle's not, not there. See, that's the whole point of a miracle. The miracle is, it's beyond your ability. Not only did God have a man waiting for Ruth, but also his providence in guiding Ruth to him was nothing short of a miracle in Naomi's life. You know, when you, when you read the last verse of Ruth chapter 1, the verse says, Naomi and Ruth, you know, arrive in Bethlehem in late spring at the beginning of the barley harvest, the Bible says. So they arrive at late spring, um, just in time for the beginning of the barley harvest. Now, Israel had a very similar kind of weather pattern to us in the sense there was rainy season and there was dry season. You know, there was, there was rains and then there were time when there was no rains. So basically, you made sure that everything was, was you know, planted so that the rains would, would produce a harvest. And just before you go into the dry season, you would harvest. So when these two women walked into Bethlehem, they were just beginning to have the harvest season for bar barley. Now, farming was one of the most popular occupations for the children of Israel. Meaning that when Naomi and Ruth walked into Bethlehem, it's not like, oh, here's Boaz's field, you can go in and help. 
When they walked into Bethlehem, there was a flutter of activity happening in Bethlehem because it was harvest season. And every good Jew who was someone who owned the land would be in their field working to have taken the harvest. Meaning the harvest was so great in many places that they would have to hire extra hands to just come and help them with bringing up the harvest. So it meant that when they walked into Bethlehem, there were hundreds and hundreds upon fields. There were hundreds hundreds and hundreds of farmers, there were hundreds and hundreds of helpers all doing one thing, they were gathering up the harvest. And all of these activity, what are the odds that the field that Ruth goes into is the exact same field that God had already prepared a man to be the husband for Ruth? What are the odds of that? I tell you, with God, there is no such thing as coincidence. He is a God of incredible precision the way He operates. You may be looking to survive, but God is going to set you up to thrive in the place that you're struggling right now. Come on, someone. Touch your neighbor and say, it's time. Your season is coming. The best is yet to come. You know, it was only at this point that, that Naomi is beginning to realize that there was a God who is actually involved in their life. Because she says to Ruth, in Ruth chapter 2, verse 20, she says to her, Then Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, she says, Blessed be he of the Lord, who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and to the dead. So in other words, Naomi is beginning to get a glimpse of this incredible work of God happening in spite of her not seeing anything. She says, hey, God hasn't forgotten us. God's working it out. What are the odds that you would be in the same field of a man who is a close relative to us? This has to be God's doing. And the third miracle that happens in the book of Ruth is this. Ruth, who was a widow, had lost her husband after 10 years. So after 10 years, she loses her husband. And during those 10 years, Ruth had not given birth to any child. Now, as was the custom during those days, when a couple could not have a child, the blame always fell squarely on the woman. So Ruth would have been labeled by society and by people around her a barren woman. That's her, her label for life. The evidence was clear. Ruth could not bear any children in her 10-year marriage. So imagine the stigma attached to both of these women when they enter into Bethlehem. People would have already written off Naomi because of her old age. And for Ruth, they would have said, who will ever want her? It's already confirmed that she's barren. Naomi, you have to come to terms that the fact that your family line is going to end with you. Your husband's lineage is not going to continue. Ruth, you have to just... Look after your mother-in-law and be content with living a life just being a caretaker for the rest of your life. This would have been common talk to these two women as they entered into Bethlehem because it was so clear that Ruth was barren from her experience. And here's the interesting fact that we need to remember about God. He loves to operate in the most hopeless of situations just because He can. I'll say it again. God loves to operate in the most hopeless of situations just because He can. Amen. Our God loves to do what everyone said cannot be done. Amen. Just so that they can stand in awe of His incredible splendor. Here walk two nobodies into Bethlehem. Their lives are hopeless. They have literally given up hope in even hoping for anything. And they've convinced themselves that they are absolutely beyond help by anyone and even God included. And it was in these moments, God begins to unveil His amazing plan for both of their lives. You know, Ruth 4.13, the Bible says, when, when Boaz took Ruth into his home and she became his wife, when he slept with her, the Lord enabled her to become pregnant. I want you to underline that scripture there. The Lord enabled her. That's a powerful, powerful thing. The Lord enabled her. Maybe people around you have written you off. 
You've heard it said so many times, it's not going to happen, that you are actually starting to believe that it's not going to happen. And when you look around you, you're convinced that there's no way that it's ever going to happen. I want to tell you this morning, God is not done with you. In the very presence of the people who said that it's never going to happen, in that same place, God is going to do the miracle so that they will watch and see God's incredible, amazing splendor over your life. Come on, church. We have an amazing God. You need to give him a round of applause for what he will do. The best is yet to come in your life. God is yet to do something amazing in your life. You just got to hold on in there. You just got to hold on to the promises that God has made over your life. You know, you may read the story of Ruth and think, oh, what's the big deal? You know, after all, it's just a child, a grandmother holding a little child, and after a long, hard, hard life, after much heartache, what's so amazing about that? But here's what I want you to pay attention to. You know, if the story had ended with just Ruth giving birth to her child, then it would have just been an ordinary story. It's pretty cool that God then allows the writer to make a little snippet of the genealogy of what was going to happen through the birth of that child as well. It's almost like God gives us a glimpse of his incredible plan and purpose in this almost trivial story that you read as well. And all of a sudden you realize even though in their ordinary life, living their ordinary day to day, God was still working something that was spectacular and that was eternal through their life as well. Come on, someone. Yeah. Now, I think one of the greatest challenges today in our world is triviality. We're all given to trivial pursuits. We become a generation that expends so much time in pursuing so many things that have so little value. And we become used to people who give up our lives and give up so much of our energy to try to accomplish and establish things that have such trivial value in the comparison of eternity. And this is where the life of a child of God needs to be distinct from the life of someone who does not know God. Because the life of a child of God is lived with the conscience that even though I may be doing things that on the outward seems ordinary, they have eternal implications. They have eternal impact in the things that I do in my life as well. On the outward, the people who lived in Bethlehem, all they saw was a two women who walked into Bethlehem who were destitute, who were widows, who were abandoned, who had nothing to live for, and yet in the lives of those two people, God was writing one of the most incredible stories of redemption that man had ever read about. And God was taking their everyday, everyday activity that they did in the fear of God, and He took those normal things and began to weave in eternal things into their life as well. Church, this is something significant I want us to understand, because it was in those moments God begins to connect, and He says, this child that, that Ruth gives birth to was no ordinary child. This son that Ruth gives birth to is in the very lineage of being a father of David, and David is not a normal person. He's supposed to be the best king that Israel would ever have. And David's not just a king, but it is in the lineage of King David where the Son of God will himself be born. I want you to understand that even though on the outward it looks normal, it looks ordinary, I am doing something extraordinary using the ordinary things that you do that will have eternal impact in your life as well. Which meant in, all, in our life, this is something we've got to hold on to. Everything we do needs to have eternal significance. Everything we do needs to somehow add to the rich work of God that He is doing in our world today. That's what happened in the life of Ruth and Naomi. Ordinary women, ordinary problems, just like everyone else had. They were not the only two widows in Bethlehem. There were many others, I'm sure. Many other people who were in the same situation or even worse, but it was in those moments of despair when they began to walk righteously before God, God begins to take their story and plug it into a grand story and make something significant out of their life. I want to tell you this morning, 
God wants to do significant things through your life as well. Through your everyday, normal living, God wants to take those things that you do. When you do it with the heart that says, God, I want the things that I do to have eternal impact. God says, I will use that to build my kingdom. I'll use that to establish the work that I'm doing in this day, in this generation. I want to tell you this morning, the story of Ruth reminds us that there's something better that's coming. You just got to keep holding on because the day is going to break. It may be a long night for some of you. It may have been a long, long, hard night, but I tell you, your morning is about to come. The sun is about to open up and your night is going to end and the weeping will cease and rejoicing and a great work of God is going to be established. You just hold on in there. You hang on in there. You got to tell yourself that God is working in my life even though I cannot see it, even though I may not be able to feel it. I know that God is working something significant in my life. I'm going to hold on to His promises. I'm going to keep speaking His word over my life and as I keep doing that, God's going to do something significant in my life as well. I want to pray this morning for people who, who may be in a similar situation to where Ruth was and Naomi were. In a, in a place that when they saw it was just hopeless in front of them. Where humanly speaking they could not see any rational way that things would ever work out. And God wants to speak to those people who are here this morning who may have walked into this service with such a sense of hopelessness about your situation. The word of God to you this morning is the best is still to come. God's going to do something significant in your life. You just have to keep on holding and keep on walking because you keep on walking, you're going to get to where God has for you as well.